Welcome to Empath Unplugged, a frequent release podcast of raw and philosophical reflections on well-being, love, and the meaning of life. Brought to you by your host, Esther Bertram, founder of The Insel, a rejuvenation island and community for empaths. Expect topics such as philosophy, psychology, art, culture, spirit, science, holistic health, and the occasional beach fire song to be part of your wonder ride to your oceanside escape. It's time to breathe in the salty air and bask in the soothing warm sun to relax, reflect, and vibe along with a fellow empath to rejuvenate. Hello listeners, welcome to today's podcast, episode number three, from the cold and rainy and quite miserable insel today. It's grey skies out there and I'm rugged up in a dressing gown and a blanket and it's probably quite appropriate for this topic. Today's topic is why and how to detangle and it's a topic very close to my heart for two reasons. One, tangling reminds me of spaghetti and I must say pasta is my number one food of all time. (laughs) I love spaghetti, but in the right context, in this podcast, there are sometimes spaghetti could be the little devil and not a good thing to be involved with. Anyway, we'll jump into that strange metaphor later. And secondly, I have spent a big chunk of my adult life in the process of detangling, I think it's a common thing for empaths to go through once we uh, become aware of how we've accidentally become entwined with certain people and even workplaces and situations because we're so good at saying yes and so good at wanting to help others and open our hearts and minds before we become conscious of the need to consider our own well-being as number one priority, we can end up in dynamics and situations that are detrimental to ourselves and others and ultimately stop us from having much energy and time to give to the world because we're in such a tangulation. And so I'm making this podcast because I've spent a lot of time detangling and if I can help any other empath in any way, even with just a little idea how they could speed up the process to detangle, then I'm happy because my mission is to try to help other empaths because I really believe in the big hearts they are and the ability when we are shining, strong, super empaths, we can really impact the world in a much bigger way. So if I can play a part in helping empaths shine, then I feel like I'm doing the job I'm meant to do. So that's why I've chosen this topic. And first I want to dive into the why, why we would want to detangle. I covered a little bit just then, but I think feeling empowered, I think most people want to feel empowered, uh, em- empaths or non-empaths or anyone on the spectrum of having even a bit of empathy, we all like to feel empowered in our life. And when we are serving other people's agendas above our own and getting swayed and pushed and pulled and caught up in other missions that are serving other people and actually doing bad things to our own health, it's not a very pleasant situation to be in. We can end up feeling drained and... Often a big problem is we can't even tune into our own inner voice because we're overwhelmed with the voices and wishes of others. And yeah, I think it's the why is because we want to feel empowered. We want to be effective as people and we want to strengthen ourselves so we can be even more sustainably impactful for ourselves and others. So That would be a core reason for me and that has been a core reason to get untangled from dynamics that don't serve the highest good of the participants and especially considering empaths putting themselves a bit higher as well. I think we're very good at serving others but I think the 
the new dawn is here where empaths can feel confident to shine brightly as number one and we'll jump into my theory because I think I can't ever help not I think I'm always going to talk about my theory because it's my reference point to put everything on um, because it helps my brain make sense of things so if you haven't heard the first episodes, I'd talk a little bit about the theory. I'll just quickly cover it for those of you who just tuned into this first time. Welcome, new listeners. And basically, I created a theory in my 20s called the 123 theory. If you want to learn more, you can head over to the123theory.com. I'm writing a book about it at the moment, and this podcast is all different topics that are like branches branches off the tree of the one two three theory and basically it's a theory that states for the sustainable energy and love to give to the world we need to be in the order of the one two three and one is ourselves two is our loved ones and close family and friends three is the rest of the world and by default most empaths are born or grow into being two, what I call two one threes, we, where we give to others first before ourselves and just by doing that we actually burn out and we don't have anything left for the number three, our impact and a contribution to the world. Or some of us end up as three two ones, which is being very cause and mission driven and that comes before even our connections with our friends and family and our well-being at the end. So it's three, two, one. And that's fine for a short period, but the point of the theory is it's not sustainable. And if you look at a whole lifetime of time and you want to have the maximum impact over that lifetime, my theory states that you need to be a one, two, three to have the biggest output by the very end. Otherwise, yeah, you can do short-term little bursts, but you just can't make the distance. It's like learning how, as an empath, how to be a marathon runner. And yeah, making the long, the long distance. Anyway, let's bring it back to this situation. And when we are in a tangulation, often a very common one is being a two one three, and that's when we are entwined with something. I'm going to just talk about romantic relationships at the moment because this is a very common thing, especially for empaths who haven't really understood their own default settings and the way they are they we end up I'll just go from my own experience and I've seen it in friends as well we end up in situations quite often actually with narcissists because or people with narcissistic um, tendencies because they are what I call a double one two three they have themselves and then they have another number one for themselves and then maybe a two, three or a three, two at the end. And when you're a two, one, three, that fits together like a jigsaw into a double one, two, three because the two is prioritizing them and because they have two ones because they're so important and the world goes around them, you just plug in like a jigsaw piece and it's happened to me a couple of times in my earlier, in my 20s, Hence me giving birth to the theory and needing to work out how to not do that again because it's not very healthy. That's why I created the theory. And then over time I've practiced and experimented with what it is like to be a one, two, three, which is much healthier. And I'm now at a point in my life where my one is really quite balanced. I have really good twos, which is if you have healthy twos, which is your relationships, they are mutually beneficial. They are not you give, 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 and they take, 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 take in friendships and work and relationships, which I have done in all three of those departments a lot. <laughs> uh, these days I work with people when it's mutually beneficial these days. My friendships are mutually beneficial these days. My relationships are mutually beneficial. And because of that, and I have my one thriving and I have mutually beneficial relationships, I have all this extra energy for number three contribution. And so 
what I'm doing with that is I'm doing this podcast. I'm writing a book. I run a community. I run a publishing house. I'm head of marketing or chief marketing. I was um, promoted. I can have to put the new name. I'm chief marketing officer for another company. I have a million things on the go and I generally handle them all quite well. And I think it's because of the theory and I have that excess energy to spend. If I zip back to my 20s and when I think about one particular relationship I was in, which I was hardcore 213 with a very narcissistic person who was a double 123, my whole time was spent analyzing the relationship, trying to work out what I'm doing wrong, what he's doing wrong, what, how I ended up there, what did he mean when he said that, why, why does he want me to do that, all about him, 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 him. I couldn't even focus on, I was, had a music career at the time in Europe and doing a lot of touring and you know, trying to record my next album before the tour and it was really hard to have my headspace and heart space I mean, on the positive, it did give me good resources to write songs about (laughs) uh, because it was very challenging emotionally and so I had the outlet of music. But honestly, it was not as impactful as I wish it could be. So I urge all empaths, especially newly realised empaths, to really take stock of your situation and try to detangle because... You have so much capacity to do beautiful things in the world for others because of your big shining heart, but you can't shine brightly when you're caught up in one or two or three people's agendas that just tax all your energy. It's much harder to have a bigger reach and feel great and healthy when that is consuming all your energy. So I'm on a mission to help as many empaths become one, two, threes as I can (laughs) So if I don't know if that theory makes sense to you, but that's how I created it to make sense for myself. And yeah, sometimes it's simple things are very hard to put into place, but they sometimes help. So before we look into how to solve it, I want to jump into where it comes from in the first place. Why are we two one threes or three two ones? Why do empaths become empaths or are we just born like that now this is a whole subject of its own but I'll do a very quick analysis from my perspective and I think there's two reasons we're empathic one is born from trauma so when people are born into a situation that they're not old enough yet to really work out how to be safe in a situation but they sense any kind of danger you are programmed to be on high alert like an animal. It's animal instinct of survival. And I think that's a hard thing to shake off when you grow up if you have that as at a young age. And being able to tune into the subtle energies and agendas of other people and almost pulled outside of yourself to feel into what's going to happen so you can place yourself within the reality in the safest position This is something that stays with us when we're adults and something you need to unlearn and work out if you're safe or not now that you're an adult and kind of unwind that high alertness, um, which is, yeah, this is a whole topic of another podcast. I won't go further into it, but that's one angle, one birth of empathy, empaths, is from trauma. The other, I think, really just comes down to being born highly sensitive and this having this wider spectrum of senses. So being able to tune into things outside of the normal frequency spectrum in the various senses that humans have and that can be genetic and it could be environmental and nurtured and natured and sometimes some empaths have both you have that sensitivity and you have the trauma and then you become a hardcore empath that needs to often do extra work because often it's very very overwhelming a lot of people like that end up 
turning to drugs and trying to numb it out because it's just very intense and a lot of therapy needs to usually happen um, to kind of, yeah, get get through what it's like to make sense of those first impressions and experiences that we had and um, come to a nice balance as an adult and as a thriving empath. I think that's the whole purpose of a lot of empaths. We want to get towards being fully thriving in our work life and love. So what can happen if we're in tangling unhealthy relationships it can be very toxic and especially being in hardcore 213 and double 123 intersections where you're giving all your energy to just potentially one person it's sometimes very hard to give up and change that because it's so consuming it's almost like a black hole you can get sucked into it so strongly it's hard to hard to get out of and often our self-esteem is weakened at those at that stage as well and we can feel depleted and very swayed by the ocean of emotion I always call it the ocean of emotion because I see water as being a very emotional element and as an empath I relate to the concept of having other people's emotions as the ocean and I like to see myself living on a happy island which I actually now live on a happy island (laughs) away from the ocean of emotion but when we're in these tangulations it can be very like the tides pushing and pulling us and drowning us in their emotions and yeah we need to we need to surf the waves or get on an island or get on the mainland to, to get away from it so the other really important thing is hearing our own inner voice because our inner voice knows what's best for our well-being. But when we're in tangulations, we only hear others much louder than ourselves. So I think on a philosophical level, it's just not right or healthy for empaths to be in such dynamics for too long because we have so much more potential in us to be shining beacons for others and we want to sustain our energy for a longer period. So I think heading towards as many mutually beneficial relationships as we can is a good aim to have purely because we have so much to give, not purely, but as well as we have so much to give as empaths we have the biggest hearts and when we in mutually beneficial relationships it creates such a flowing energy I always see it like an infinity sign that just flows back and forward between the two people and friendships and work and relationships and the byproduct of that is immense it's beautiful and it's like golden energy that just you can flow into your cause or your impact businesses and yeah this podcast is purely to try to help people get into more mutually beneficial and less consuming tangulations so a little bit about why this is important to me I I really struggled with this when I was younger I when I was around 18 I was in a really quite abusive relationship I'd moved out of home when I was 16 due to dynamics there that were easier for me to deal with if I just wasn't there and but I I ended up then in not the best situation with somebody very complex and I turned to marijuana at the time to escape it it was just very emotional and abusive that Thankfully, I got away from that and went to university. I studied music. I started cleaning up my life. I was 19 then at the time and feeling really great on a great path then because I started realizing more about my well-being and what I needed to do. But I still felt unprotected. And I remember going to university and the lady at the office, she was quite grumpy all the time and she was just the receptionist. And I remember she would just say, I don't know, something really quite minimal and small to me. 
and I remember just crying about it all the time. And at, I ended up with this really beautiful um, partner at the time and he gave me some advice. He knew I was em- an empath and uh, how sensitive I was. He was a very in tune, loving and nurturing man. And he gave me this whole visualization to do, which was putting myself in an egg. And he just saw how affected I was by external people's thoughts and feelings and actions. And anyway, I did this exercise. And if you want to learn about this exercise, I've made a free meditation with it. And if you just go to the Insel dot com t-h-e-i-n-s-e-l dot com and look for free meditation i have the whole egg meditation in there and it's really helpful for setting boundaries and detangling yourself and what i did i did it every single day on my way walking into the university until it became a body memory and i no longer had to visualize it but our mind is such a powerful device that if you repeat something enough and it becomes a habit, it becomes then a reality and it really helped me. And that was the beginning of me taking responsibility for my own reactions to actions and detangling from others' stuff. Because that lady, she it wasn't personal. I think she was just very grumpy in her own life. But back then I was so young and open and naive to the universe and the life that I just was swayed and upset. And I remember that that was quite a strong uh, re- a confirmation to me that it was really important I did some of this self-work. Later on, when I was in my 20s, I'd travelled the world, becoming a musician, lived in Germany, I moved to England. I ended up in, that's when I gave birth to my theory because that's when I was with this other relationship and it was very consuming and he was lovely but on some levels and extremely charming and good looking and just fun but so, so detrimental. Um, I realised, okay, I need to do more work and have more parameters around that are going to protect me basically from myself, from my own weaknesses and inability to know my boundaries and how to protect myself and feel good and not end up in such dynamics again. And I ended up doing one year of transpersonal psychotherapy then and that was mind-blowing. And I was in my 20s and if anyone's listening to this and you're young in dynamics that drain your energy, I highly recommend starting to see a therapist or even an empathic an empath coach in our community actually there's a lot of coaches in there who have joined because they help you um ref- they hold up a mirror i mean my lady that i saw she was phenomenal she was from france and she just i went there first for my dream training because i did a lot of lucid dreaming and I wanted to understand more that realm and but it ended up going down a rabbit hole of a can of worms that seemed to never end and it's just phenomenal I loved that year of my life for that experience and yeah it was was when I really decided I need to prioritize well-being and actively implement the one two three and yeah that was 20 years ago and it's taken me two decades and I'm finally here now, (laughs) I think, but it's an ongoing process. Every day I still have to make sure my numbers are in order. And anyway, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a three-step plan now of just how you could start. If you're in this situation, if you're listening to this and you're a thriving one, two, three, I congratulate you because I know how hard work it is and know what it's taken for me to get to this. If you're listening to this and you relate to being in a dynamic that is draining for you or it might seem like a, uh, you're a 213 right now and you're with a 1123 or any kind of dynamic that is you, you just, if you think of the word toxic, you just know it is toxic on an intuitive level. 
I think you probably, you might have even been drawn to the title of this podcast. It might be good for you to start this untangling process and so you can have more energy and and feel much healthier in your life. So I'll give you a three-step plan to start detangling and I'm going to put it in the three letters ACE because it does feel ACE to be detangled and ACE represents, I talk about ACE in my book actually as well, slightly in a different usage, but it is, A is for awareness. So the first step is becoming aware of your toxic relationships and awareness can come from, it depends what kind of mind you are, but it can be as simple as getting away from your situation, walking in nature removing yourself, going on a holiday, getting headspace a way that you can just have perspective, look at it from the moon and just, it's, A can also be for audit. You do an audit of your life and look at all your relationships and see which ones are mutually beneficial, which ones you pour into and you get absolutely nothing back. Sometimes it's necessary if you have someone who's unwell or a child or some. sometimes it's obviously you'll know if it's something that you want to keep doing. And sometimes you'll look at them and even they can be family members and you just think, you just shake your head and think, oh my goodness, I have been giving far too much into this and not getting enough back and therefore I don't have much energy for anything else but this dynamic. If that happens, you know you have to start a detangling process. You might be someone who's very analytical and loves Excel documents and pros and cons lists. That's another way you can get awareness of these relationships and just put chart them all out and make a whole PowerPoint document for yourself about from a rational perspective what's really going on. The other thing you can do is ask friends and family who really know you well and and you know 100% they have your well-being as as so important for them. Then you can trust their opinion and you can go to them. You might not like the answer, especially if you're in a longer-term relationship with somebody. It's like a push-pull relationship you love, but you, on some level, you know it's toxic. Uh, ask them to hold a mirror up for you and tell you the raw truth. Uh, another thing you can do for awareness is yeah, see a coach or a therapist. As I said, you could join the Insel community. We have lots of coaches in there that might be able to help you, even just leaning on an empath, a fellow empath, because a lot of us have been through this. And I would say wise and potentially older empaths who have gone through the work and the process and who are <clears throat> what I call one, two, threes, they are a really good resource because they've been through it and know what it feels like and what it takes to get out of that. But basically it's getting perspective, gaining perspective and awareness of what's required. That is step number one. The second step, C of the ACE, A-C-E, is calibration. So it's recalibrating. You do this with, you can do it with programs or engines or humans, <laughs> empaths. And starting a process of becoming a one, two, three. <clears throat> and I'm an f- absolute believer in my own theory because I'm living it. And it's putting yourself and your well being first because you will have much more to give everybody if you do that over the longest period. So you need to start working on some ways that you can adjust your life and tweak it like an engine. Maybe you have to give up some things or start some things where you know for sure that is putting your own well-being first. And this could mean some pruning of your relationships. I also like seeing relationships like a garden and there's a lot of things I see like a garden actually Um, but it's like life life seems to mirror back things so obviously all the time but if you look at your life and your friendships and your family your number twos in your life like a garden you can have a wild 
jungle of a garden with everything growing and the weeds are growing and the poisonous things are growing and they're suffocating the beautiful trees that bring all the fruit and the beautiful flowers that get no light. They're your toxic relationships and I'm actually not a very good gardener, to be honest. In real life, I don't like pulling weeds or pruning. Um, but in this metaphor, it's really conducive to your happy garden state because if you can cut back those weeds, if you can prune those branches, if you can remove the poisonous fruits and thistles from your garden you will get a much bigger harvest you'll have beautiful grass to sit on and enjoy much more all of your high quality friendships and family engagements because life is precious life is short if you look at it even if you live to 111 it is still a short window of time as a human on this planet and I think we can do so much with that time if we live in manicured gardens but it takes work anyway step three is e for engaging and that is when you engage new habits and practices and people i'm not saying go and get engaged i mean maybe you want to maybe you've found your perfect partner then yes great i'm bringing the wedding bells over here for you but just make sure they're mutually beneficial. So engaging in habits and practices that are really healthy and going to ensure and support your mutually beneficial relationship. And if you don't know how to do that, again, counsellor or a coach or a therapist can really help you set up those milestones and parameters and hold up the mirror for you because sometimes it's hard to see without somebody externally doing that for you. So that's the three steps I would suggest to get started in your detangling process. One thing, if, if you want to learn more about this and the ACE method, as I said, check out the123theory.com. My book's currently on pre-order as I record this, or you might be listening to this after it's been released. You can buy it there to jump further into that. You can join our community and connect with fellow empaths or even maybe find a coach there. The other thing you can do is download the meditation on theinsel.com and learn about the egg protection. And there are three extra takeaways you can do to lead you towards um, feeling detangled and thriving and just a recap of why we'd want to do that you will have so much more energy you'll feel great in life when you're not tangled like a spaghetti you'll be able to hear your own inner voice better because the other voices will be quieter you'll be able to set boundaries more easily it's like when when you've weeded a garden it's much easier to see the weeds when they pop up that's like having a boundary you see it straight away and you know it doesn't belong in the garden but when it's a tangle of craziness and wildness you can't see what's what and it's very very difficult to navigate sometimes and yeah when you have more energy for yourself you'll have more energy for your loved ones your mutually beneficial relationships and you'll have a lot more energy for the world and you'll be able to sustain it over a longer period because yeah you don't want to be drowned in the ocean of emotion because yeah it's not very pleasant and you want to be part of this new wave of super empaths and to be a super empath one of the core tasks we have to do is detangle detangle and then you can thrive it's one of the core to do's on the empath to do list <laughs> um, and I can't wait to see all of my fellow empath friends and family thriving in all areas of your life um, because I feel like the empaths we can shine our diamond hearts really strongly and help lead society from a heart-led um, perspective because there's been so much head leading and ego leading and Ah, uh, old guard leading and the new wave is coming through where intuitive, heart-led, 
peace, love and happiness leading is coming through and empaths have a big part to play in that. Well, I see it like that anyway. And I'm we're coming towards the end of the podcast now. I'm going to leave you with a little Christopher Morley quote, which is no man, I'm going to put in an extra bit, or woman, is lonely eating spaghetti. It requires too much attention. And that's exactly it. Spaghetti, as much as I love it, and it's my favorite food actually, it's so tangly and takes so much of our time, energy, love and attention. And it's much more effective to be a thriving one, two, three, water fountain of love, spending your time eating spaghetti, a lot of it, (laughs) than being tangled in it. And in the last episode, I left you with an excerpt from my book, November Fox, who's an orphan, vegan, empath, rock star, traveling dimensions of, dimensions of consciousness to understand the workings of a teleporting cube that takes her through realms of mind, heart, body, soul, purpose, and facing her shadows. And one of the chapters, when she's trapped between worlds and she has this moment where she finally gets to hear her inner voice her her inner voice is quite a cheeky inner voice so I thought it's a good little excerpt to leave you with today for story time and then I'll wrap up a bit after that so here's a little bit of November Fox following Joy and her interaction with her inner voice where are you Who are you? November inquired. I am your inner voice. My inner voice? She asked, scrunching up her face. If you're my inner voice, why haven't you talked to me before? You haven't been close enough to listen to me. November lifted her head and looked at the mysterious talking floor and then placed her ear back down. I'm not sure if I believe you. You don't sound like me. Why do you have the voice of someone else? You're tricking me. Test me, challenged the voice. Ask me something no one but you knows. Well, I guess that will work. Okay, give me a moment. Question me on anything. The voice was clearly enjoying itself. Okay, voice. What's my favourite food ever, and where do I like best to eat it? Spaghetti! I yelled at the screen. That is so easy, laughed the voice. Where's your imagination? November was not sure if she liked the voice's attitude, even if it claimed to be her own. If you are who you say you are, you should know the answer to that, she quipped. Touché. You love tofu satay, but most of all pasta. And you like to dine in Rome, in that restaurant with the red chairs, to be precise. The voice stated matter-of-factly. I was pleased with myself that I, too, knew the answer. It was quite an easy one. Hmm, well, perhaps you're right, voice. But why are you so separate from me, if you are me? I'm not convinced. Imagine your mind has two sections. Your conscious mind that works more while you're awake and your unconscious mind that is alive and processing while you sleep. November tried to imagine her mind as a picture with two halves. In her mental image, she put one half under the sun and the other under the moon. I'm imagining the sides. Clever girl, the voice said, with a hint of sarcasm. Now imagine the two parts as riverbanks. On the river sails a little wooden boat. Okay, well, I am on the boat. November started to grasp what the voice meant, although she still didn't understand how that would be possible. Suddenly, something dawned on me. What if Mother had left in search of the world of form? Perhaps she was on a similar boat, attempting to cross the oceans of layered reality like I wished to do. What if she was a new baby in form already? My mind boggled at the possibilities. So where am I in this picture? November asked, indulging the voice. Well, right now you're on the bridge that crosses the river the voice said, and paused a moment. That is the reason you can perceive me. I am sailing down the river between the two hemispheres of your brain. You do sound familiar, but I can't remember when we met. 
she rolled over to change the air held to the floor. Do you remember me telling you to apply for the scholarship for the Brighton Institute of Music? asked the voice. Yes, I remember. If it was you saying just do it, just do it, over and over again, I worried that a Nike ghost from one of their commercials had possessed me. Yes, that was me. Or what about when I told you about Mr. Russell's accident before anyone else? Yes, a voice in my head told me when I woke up that very morning. Later I got the phone call confirming the sad news of his broken leg. I remember wondering how strange that I knew already. Yep, me again. With more memories emerging, November frowned. Was it you telling me I wasn't good enough for that first major concert? When I had the meltdown? No, no, no. That was my evil twin brother, Ekiov. Huh? Is he Russian? Ha, no. Well, where is he now? Let's just say that I accidentally forgot to bring two life vests on a sailing trip we took a few years ago. What? So are you saying that Ekiov fell into one of my brain hemispheres? Um, well, yes, but don't worry, he can't swim. Goodness, voice, I'm not sure you and I are related. Be a warrior, not a warrior. Hmm, that's a good one. Funny, it's the second time I've heard that phrase today. I'll remember that. You may be useful after all, even if you are a murderer. It takes one to know one. November didn't reply, as an image of Reb Mevan flashed before her eyes. Sorry, touchy subject. I should know better, the voice said. Yes, you should. Well, my apologies. Because I live on this river between your two minds, I access all your information, some of which is in the past and the future, beyond what your conscious side knows. My heart skipped a beat. The voice talked of a place like Lusitopia. I could not believe it. Who was this voice? What do you mean, beyond what I know? November queried. I can connect to all the memories you have buried in your subconscious. I can also see the future. You see, my river runs into the ocean of the collective unconscious. The voice further explained. My job is to guide you, since I can tap into all the places you can't. What on earth is the collective unconscious? It is the universal library of all human knowledge. Every person has a river in their mind that leads to the collective ocean that we all share. Wow, it must be a gigantic ocean, November said, scrunching her brow, trying to grasp the idea of a place big enough for all human knowledge. All of a sudden it dawned on me that my plan to put a message in a bottle may just work after all. Since all rivers are connected and all go to the same enormous sea, surely I can send the letter through the undercity canals in Lusitopia. Eventually, it would be sure to find someone far, far away, even if it arrives at a strange point in linear TikTok. I felt, without a shadow of a doubt, that I must write this letter and put it in a bottle. Why can't I always listen to your voice? I mean, my voice, so you can tell me the answers I'm searching for? November asked her cheeky yet wise in a voice. Because you fill up your conscious mind with so many thoughts and inner chitter-chatter, the voice replied. November recalled the high priestess's words. Endless distraction. I call out to you, but all you listen to is your relentless chatter, chatter, chatter from your thinking mind. Thinking this, planning that, chat, chat, chat. November wondered if she actually chatted as much as the voice said. See, even now you're contemplating whether you chatter all the time, aren't you? Goodness, voice. You honestly can read my thoughts, November said, wide-eyed at the idea. She again rolled over to give her squashed ear a rest. You'd be shocked to know how hoarse I get, screaming out through the cacophony of your conscious mind's voices. You don't realize that lemon soothers are hard to get here on the river. November laughed, glad her inner voice had a sense of humor. She wished Klaus were here to share the moment with her. If you're really... My inner voice. Guide me now. What should I do? She asked. You're on the right path. Am I? Yes, you are. The irony is, now that you're listening to me, we're no longer separate, and I've done my job. I'm now free to enjoy a leisurely cruise down my river. You're a funny voice. I am you, and you are me.
But now that I can hear you, shouldn't you make the most of the situation and tell me something important? November asked, thinking it strange her inner voice wanted a vacation the moment she could finally hear her. No, no, no. The content doesn't matter. The key is the fact we're talking. Go on with your travels. You're a smart, kind person, mostly. You know what to do, she said, then paused. Only one piece of advice. What? Stop with your paranoia. You're no longer at the orphanage. You're safe now. Remember that. Okay, I will try to. I hope I can talk to you again sometime. Well, I'm always here, streaming along. Yes, I suppose you are. Would you mind doing me a favor? Sure, what would you like, voice? But please don't ask for a fishing rod to fish out Ekiov. <laughs> no, the voice laughed. I'm considering getting a waterproof amplifier and microphone. If you would check eBay for me, that'd be fantastic. Terrible Wi-Fi connection down here. Too much interference. November laughed. <laughs> okay, bye-bye, voice. Hasta la vista, replied the voice. November stood up. Goodness me, she said aloud into the white room. This place gets more and more interesting by the minute. She walked over to the picture at the back of the leaning block tower and touched it with her finger. In a flash, the vacuum of the scene engulfed her. Excitement overtook my being, imagining the possibility of writing you a letter and sending it to the collective ocean. Charlie and I did a few loop-de-loops in the air. What a glorious day it will be if I ever find out that it reached you safely. In that moment, I felt compelled to search for the paper to prepare my first documentation. And here I am, telling you it all now. Although, by the moment you read this, TikTok may have unfolded to a later moment. Yet still, no doubt, a now in its own right. Perhaps you do not travel linear TikTok after all. Maybe you just conclude that you do. Hmm. It is all rather mystifying. So that was November Fox. If you want to hear more of the audiobook November Fox, just head over to either the website consciousfiction.com.au or just novemberfox.com and it'll take you straight through to that page. If you've enjoyed this episode, I would love it if you could leave a review because what happens with reviews is the algorithm then if I get any positive reviews, it promotes it to more empaths and if this brought you any value, hopefully we can share it to more empaths, especially young empaths who are struggling to detangle maybe this helps them speed up that process a little bit and i'd love it if it could reach them so leaving a review is a lovely way for you to contribute to helping other empaths detangle as well okay i hope you've liked this episode and i look forward to sharing more perspectives and thoughts and feelings with you in the next one till next time bye bye Today's episode is sponsored by StepbyStepGuitarLessons.com, your go-to course if you're an absolute beginner and want to learn guitar. I have taught hundreds of students with my fast track method from ages 6 to 80. With lifetime access, these self-paced online lessons mean you can learn in the comfort of your own home. The bite-sized lessons are very easy to follow and the platform keeps track of your progress. This course is tailored for absolute newbies and is much more effective than random YouTube videos or learning from your Uncle Steve who may not have the patience required to teach at a true beginner's pace. You are guaranteed to get fast results and if you don't like the learning style, there is a 30-day no questions asked money back guarantee. Plus it only costs the price of two in-person lessons but you get over 50 there are several studies that prove that learning a musical instrument is the only activity to light up almost all areas of the brain at once. Making music has the power to soothe your soul, heal your body and bring you true joy. Not to mention if you've always wanted to be a rock star, learning guitar is your ticket to do so. So if you're ready to learn or want to gift it to a friend, head over to stepbystepguitarlessons.com and enroll today. You've been listening to Empath Unplugged, a frequent release podcast of raw and philosophical reflections on well-being, love and the meaning of life. 
brought to you by your host, Esther Bertram, founder of The Insel, a rejuvenation island and community for empaths. For more information or to join the community, head over to theinsel.com. T-H-E-I-N-S-E-L.com. If you have found value from this episode and would like to become a patron to support future episodes and gain access to exclusive content only available to patrons, head over to empathunplugged.com and sign up to be part of the inner circle. Thank you for listening. Have a beautiful and rejuvenating week. Till next time. Bye-bye. Does it feel?